Good morning, all. I'm Kendi Easley. I'm one of the executive pastors here at Bethany, and I'm so excited to be with you to talk about this book of Revelation. I, I love this book, and it's really tricky because it's not just clearly telling us something. It's telling us something directly, and it's also telling us something in this giant imagery. It's as though when John, at the end of his life, he's kind of looking over his whole ministry, and and Jesus begins to speak to him through a vision and tells him exactly what to say to these seven churches. And some of it was kind of hard to hear, wasn't it? We're going to look into that. That's actually one of the things I love about following Jesus is he invites us to grow, to move from kind of where we are, who, who we would be naturally into who we can be by the power of the Holy Spirit in relationship with Jesus. So as we dive into this passage today, we are going to be laying this foundation um, that takes us through the end of the book of Revelation. If you are holding your Bible, and maybe if you followed along in our Rooted series, you would see where we are in the Bible. We are so close to the end of all the books of the Bible. And actually, that's one of my favorite parts too, because I love to know how things end. I love to watch a TV show that I know is going to show again next week, because the heroes are going to be back. I, I can trust that. I love to read a book when I, I, I look at the end of the story, like the little blurb on the back, and it gives me a sense of what's going to happen. So when I'm scared along the way, I can be confident, oh, here's how it's going to end. It has a happy ending. And that's how it is with God and with us. In the very end of the book of Revelation, the next to the last chapter, it says this, there's going to be a new heaven and an earth, a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth are passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And then John says this, and then I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And I heard a loud voice saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among people, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and he will wipe away every tear. And there will no longer be any death. And there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. That's the end of the story. That's where we're headed. So let's see how we get there. Please pray with me. Great God, we do thank you for this amazing book of scripture that has taught us all along the way about who you are and how we can know you. And today we ask that you would make yourself known as we study um, this this speaking that you gave to these seven churches. May this come alive um, to our church today in our hearts, right this very moment we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So John, who wrote the Gospel of John and was a pastor of churches, was sitting on this island called Patmos. And he was excused, kind of exiled to this island because he actually had a lot of influence. When he was 90, imagine being 90. Anybody know somebody who's 90? Yeah. Anybody here who's 90 or more? I was going to give you some applause. Uh, my dad's 90. We do a lot of reflecting about life and, and kind of his hopes for life. So when John was on this island, he was thinking about his ministry and thinking about Jesus. He was actually in worship on a Sunday, maybe singing, maybe praying in the spirit. And Jesus, as we learned from Jonathan, preached last week, and he did such a great job telling us about like how this vision came to pass. He, he had this vision, and it was a vision of somebody walking amongst lampstands. And it was like the Son of Man was walking amongst these lampstands. And the lampstands were representing seven very specific churches, in seven very specific places. And as Jesus, it became clear to John that it was Jesus, was walking amongst these lampstands, he began to speak about what John should write down and say about each of these churches. Now, this whole book of Revelation is a letter, but each of these little pieces that are written to the seven churches are as if a king said it. Because there used to be a way that the emperor would speak. And this is the form that this section takes. 
There also used to be a way in the Jewish tradition when a prophet would speak. There was a certain form that a prophet would use. And this is the form that we see in these sections written to the seven churches. So it's as if a king and a prophet came together and said these words to each of the churches. And what did he say? Well, that's what we're going to look at. He said three different things, and they're in your bulletin. The first word was a word of celebration, and the second, a word of correction, and the third, a word of commitment. When the Bethany teaching team was studying together to, uh, this past week, I think it was Jonathan who called this a compliment sandwich. So something good, something a little challenging, and then something good again. So we're going to look today at this idea of these three things. In addition to the three things, there was something that God spoke, Jesus spoke to all seven of the churches. So there were some things that were for each of them individually, and there were some things that were for everyone. Now, as we think about what was spoken, we want to think about who said it also. So who was speaking? You'll see if you follow in your rooted booklet that Revelation um, uh, describes, I think it's something like 50 names of Jesus. There are 36, 36 names in Revelation. 14 of those names of God are right here in these two chapters. Check out these names. This is, Jesus is the one who holds the seven stars. So as he's walking along, I I can't remember all these, so I'm going to take my notes. As he's walking along amongst these lampstands, John sees him as the one who holds seven stars. Can you imagine holding stars in your hand? As the one who walks around the churches, as the one who has a sharp double-edged sword, not just a double-edged sword, a sharp double-edged sword, one who is the son of God, one who searches hearts and minds one who holds the seven spirits of God, one who is holy and true, one who holds the key of David. So this person who is speaking, uh, as Megan uh, led us, is, is very powerful, who opens doors that no one can shut, who shuts doors that no one can open. This is the amen. This is the faithful and true witness. This is the ruler of God's creation. When you hear all those attributes, does it seem like that's someone you want to listen to? Like 100%. This is the first and last. This is God himself speaking these words. So who is Christ God speaking to? He's speaking to the church. So I think in our day, it's so easy to think he's speaking to me. What is God saying to me? And that's 100% true. But when these... uh, edicts, if you will, were written, they were meant to be read and shared across the church. They were written to a whole church. Um, I've really been helped in this sermon by Pastor Eugene Peterson, who has a book called Reversed Thunder. So you may hear me uh, quoting different things from him. One of those is this, it is not possible to know Christ apart from the church. That's a big statement. It's not possible to have Christ apart from the church. Peterson goes on to say, we would very much like to have Christ apart from the contradiction and distractions of other people who believe in him or say that they do. Doesn't that kind of describe our American Christendom right now? We're we're not aligned. We can be aligned on who Jesus is, but what that looks like in our lives can be very different. Peterson says, we are ardent after God, but cool toward the church. But the gospel says, no, write to the seven churches. Write to people, absolutely. The gospels are all full of writing to individuals. But in this book, it's written to the seven churches as a corporate. So what is the Spirit saying to these seven churches? Uh, It says, write to the angel of the church of, and then it names off the different ones. The angel, does every church have an angel? Do do churches have guardian angels? There's another thing about Revelation that's fabulous. It's so mysterious. We didn't know we had maybe a guardian angel as a church, did we? Say this, that the one who did all those things that I just described, that, that one knows your church. 
and knows your works. That's a little uncomfortable for us, that God is looking at the church and saying, I see your works. I see how you're living out your faith or not living out your faith. It feels a little uncomfortable, like we're getting evaluated. And then what's said seven times is if anyone has ears, hear what the church is saying, hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. So whatever difference there is between the churches, there are a couple of things that are consistent. One, the spirit speaks, and two, the people listen. So let's talk just for a minute about listening. I'd like to, you go ahead, how many ears do all of you have? Two, right? Does anybody have ear lids? Right? We have two eyes with eyelids. Our, our eyes sort of rest. Our ears are like always on duty. Why? It's, it's almost like God wants to ensure, it's like double duty. You, you have two ears, one mouth, and eyes that open and shut, a lot of other pairs and dozens of things, but two ears. Why? Because listening seems to be so important. But we can develop sort of selective listening. We can conveniently be sort of deaf to sounds that challenge us or command us or tell us what to do. I learned this phrase called heavy ears. Sometimes we have heavy ears. Like we, we, just, we just don't want to hear certain things. Heavy ears make it possible to pursue wrongful pleasures to indulge in empty dreams, to escape onerous tasks with only minimal discomfort of conscience. We listen for what we care about. Let me tell you who has the best ears in our household. I think I have a picture of him. Yep. That little guy, our puppy, one-year-old now, named Jack, can hear so well when he wants to. He hears when the food is coming. Actually, when we open the refrigerator, he, he has cold food. When we get the cold food and bring it out, he, can, he knows just the weight of it that lands on the counter. He knows just the sound of his bowl that we're getting it out. And he loves to rest in the living room while my husband, who loves to read his Bible and pray, truly, he does it on behalf of both of us. I know that doesn't really work, but that's how it feels. He many hours will spend sitting in his chair thinking and praying and reading. And that dog, Jack, knows when my husband's computer just goes, just, it's just the quietest little sound. And Jack jumps up and runs over like, what are we going to do? Are we going walking? Is it another meal? Like, you're going to get up. I know something's going to happen. He has ears to hear everything that my husband does. And he he almost anticipates what's going to come next. How about us? Are our ears awake? That's how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message. Are your ears awake Are your ears tuned in for, like, God might want to do something? So listening is this task of the church. And it's said in this passage seven times to each of the churches, hear what the Spirit is saying. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Okay, count with me. Hear what the Spirit is saying. 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 saying. It must be important So that's it. Seven times we hear that message. And here's the details. The celebration, the correction, and the commitment. How do we hear the Spirit's voice in celebration? There were specific celebrations about each of these churches. Ephesus, they did hard work. They persevered. They tested the false prophets. They tested the teaching. In Smyrna, they had endurance through afflictions and poverty. Not easy, but they were rich in faith. In Philadelphia, they kept God's word, and they didn't deny his name, even though they were weak and tired. So God sees this, and God celebrates this. 
I, I wonder how we like to celebrate. There's a, I personally love to receive words of affirmation. And I was recently, I got to co-host a party for someone. And we were so excited about the party. We planned out all the food and we planned out a party game and we had special flowers and it was a bride. So we had a picture of the bride and groom and we were just so happy to celebrate her. And we were all sitting around and we were gonna give her the gifts. And she said, just a minute. I don't know if you all know each other. And I'd like to tell you how important each of you are. There are about a dozen of us. Each of you are to me. And she took a moment and she looked each one of us in the eye and said, like, thank you for being part of my journey. Thank you for encouraging me to go on that first date or the second date or the 15th date that led to the marriage. Thank you for walking alongside me when things have been rough. And she just had this personal way of celebrating each of us when we were there to celebrate her. This is what God does. We, we worship God. We're like amazed at who God is, holds the seven stars in his hand. And that God looks at each one of these churches and says, I see you. I, I celebrate you. I'm so glad for who you are as a church. So he takes that time to make it personal. It's Great to get like a Starbucks freebie on your birthday. Have you ever done that? You go in, you should know. You go in, show your driver's license if you're that age. I don't know how it works for kids. If you get a freebie on your birthday, maybe parents testify. And it's, it's a freebie. It's the same freebie for everyone. That's so different, though, than getting a personal card from someone who really knows you, isn't it? Like, both are great. Did you know that if when you turn 100, you can get a letter from the president? You have to write in and ask for one. If you live in Ireland, when you turn 100, you get something called the, it's like the centennial bounty. It's a gift of money, 2,500 euros. And the check is sent to somebody who knows you, often a pastor. Wouldn't that be fun? You get sent a check for $2,500 and you get to take it over to the person who turned 100 and, and give them that check. It's a personal celebration for a life of faithfulness. So God appreciates each of these seven churches. Then he goes on to correct each of them, almost to reform each of them. It's like, I see who you are. It's pretty good. It can be better. I don't know. Do you like that? Does that sound good? It doesn't sound so good to me. I I want to tell you about an experience that I've had um, I like to row crew. I'm not very good at it, but I love it. Maybe when you've been around Green Lake, you've seen these great big boats. They have eight people in them, sometimes a coxswain, so a ninth person. The coxswain's just there to tell you what to do, and everybody else is rowing. And that very first person who's next to the coxswain who's saying, like, row, 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 that very first person is called the stroke, and they're the leader. So you're supposed to follow that stroke. You want to come help me? Come on up. Okay. Okay, here's your job. You, you look out to them and go like this. Okay, now pretend you've got an oar in your hand. It's really long. It goes all the way to the edge of the piano. Okay, you're just going to go straight back like this. Now, I'm supposed to follow him pretty exactly, and there's more details to it, like exactly how high we should pull in. Now, go a little faster. Now, go as fast as you can. Oh, what? Are we going the same time? Kind of. <laughs> Okay, go slower. Go really slow. Go slower like you want me to follow every move. Beautiful. See how it gets better? Well, when we're rowing, how are you doing okay? Okay, keep rowing. We have a coach. Megan, you want to come be the coach? Megan's really good. She actually does coach crew. The coach is in a boat and has something maybe like a megaphone. And you would maybe give some advice. And she might say something like, Now, if he's in seat eight and I'm in seat seven, she might call out to see seat seven. You don't have a microphone, so you can't call out. But she would say something like, hey, pull in a little higher. Well, I would say watch their elbow. Oh, good. See, she would say advice like that. And she would call out, hey, seat seven. Now, when you're in a boat like this and you get called out, how does it feel? Not so good, (laughs) right? Okay, thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause. Multiply that by eight people all trying to row together. Multiply that by a whole church 
trying to row together in the same direction. It's not easy. And that's why God speaks these words of correction to each of these churches. He, he has something to say. Interestingly, the ones that are under the most persecution, he doesn't correct. It's almost like, hey, life is so tough for you all. Just hang in there. Like, keep going. The rest of you, I want to make some corrections. Because you can be more than you are right now. So in, in this correcting aspect, strengths are recognized and developed and weaknesses are exposed and, and corrected. There's a proverb that says this, wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Wounds from a sincere friend, ouch. Have you ever received that kind of input or feedback? Maybe it's come from somebody at work where, like, hey, you seem a little short-tempered. Hey, that decision that you made, I wish you would have consulted me about it. Maybe it's at home. Hey, I just need to give you the feedback that when you leave your stuff all over the house, somebody's got to pick it up. Maybe it's at church, like, hey, we need your hands. We need your smile. We need you to be part of it. Can, Can you take that step? Peterson says the church attracts to itself people who like to live in an atmosphere of the holy, but they have little interest in actually being holy themselves. Ouch. That's kind of a hard critique. I was sitting at the table with some friends the other night, and we got to talking about the impact of someone's choices on others. And two of the guys who were sitting at the table both had dads that drank too much alcohol. They were both alcoholics. And one's dad kept drinking his whole life. The other guy's dad joined Alcoholics Anonymous and stopped drinking and lived for 35 years sober. When his memorial service was held, there were 200 people who were there from his influence through AA. They talked about him as a sponsor. They talked about being in prison and him coming to visit them. They talked about how their life had been changed because of his choosing to become sober. There's consequences to the choices that we make. I want you to imagine these seven churches. They were actual physical places, and now's when I'd love to see that map. These churches are where the stars are, and right below, I think below the S of Ephesus is where the island of Patmos is. So John was hearing this, receiving this vision on that island, and he was thinking about these churches that were actual places. They're current places today. They don't all have living churches, but they were only, I looked this all up, they're It was only like a circumference of something like, let's say, Bellingham. Anybody anybody been to Bellingham? How about Leavenworth? Anybody been to Leavenworth? Beautiful. How about like halfway to Portland? I don't know. Is that like the border? You've been on your way to Portland. That's about the space of these churches. That's where they were located. Now, I want you to imagine if these churches had not taken the corrections that were offered to them, where do you think Christianity would probably be located today? Maybe the island of Patmos. (laughs) Like all of these early churches had to respond to the Spirit of God. They had to hear what the Spirit was saying, and they had to act on it. If they would have just kept to themselves, Christianity would have died out from the people who had only the people who'd been with Jesus or maybe the Apostle Paul or maybe John himself. But God gives the spirit in order that the church would grow and grow and grow. I looked it up. There are 2 billion Christians in the world today. 2 billion. How can that be? There's only about 340 million people in the United States. If you took the whole United States and multiplied by five, that's how many Christians there are in the world. What would God want to say to the church today? Like what if those churches, it represents like hundreds of thousands of churches. And there's like one church that has hundreds of thousands of people in it. It's in uh, South Korea. However... Let's go back to the point. The spirit of God is speaking to the people of God as a whole. 
Do we have ears to hear? Do we have ears to hear not only the celebration, but the correction? And then thirdly, we want to look at the Spirit's voice in commitment, the promises, the motivation, the way the Spirit wants to move, and, and what's going to be given. I don't know, do you guys like to get awards? I really like to get awards. Um, my kids used to like to get awards, and we have a lot of these. I think this is like an early trophy for my son's piano. He stuck with it, and eventually, I think he was in high school when he got the really big trophy. If you have the choice, do you want the little trophy or you want the big trophy? God wants to give us the big trophy. God wants to be so present to us that he's saying, you're living a life that's far bigger than it would have ever been on your own. You're living to the fullness of what I have for you. And that's what this commitment is, that God is saying, you, you're getting the big trophy. You have the right to eat of the tree of life. You're gonna have the crown of life. You're gonna be made a pillar in the temple of God. You're gonna have God's name written on you. You're gonna be welcomed into the pearly gates, whatever that looks like. You're gonna be part of the new heaven and the new earth. It's a mystery. But you're gonna be one with all the people who went before. You're part of this great cloud of witnesses. Jesus concludes the whole thing this way. Oh, before I get to my conclusion, I wanted to tell you this. If it seems confusing and you need a little summary, I heard a professor theologian describe the challenge of the book of Revelation in these three simple points. The first thing you should know is this, God's team wins. In the end, God's team wins. Here's your responsibility, pick a team. And then thirdly, just don't be stupid. It's kind of obvious. So God's writing a story in his church. And and this section of scripture closes this way. Jesus says, I stand at the door and... Did you hear it? What is it? Knocking. Jesus, it's a verb. He's knocking. He's always knocking. And the handle to the door is on our side. Jesus says, I stand at the door and... Whoever hears my voice, I'll come in. I'll dine with them. I'll be with you. He spoke these words to the church. I think we often are thinking, Jesus is knocking, let him on in. Jesus is constantly knocking, church. And sometimes we're not letting him in. Sometimes we're sitting at the dinner table and it's like, oh, I forgot, Jesus is at the door. We gotta go let him in. We gotta invite him in again. We gotta remember every day that God is for us, that God wants to be with us. So Bethany, now I'm gonna get to meddling. In what way is God celebrating the church at Bethany, the church in Seattle? In what way is God calling us to correction? Is God calling us forward? I'm so excited about the things that are happening. In fact, I. I just asked Jonathan to remind me of all our priorities. We have a priority on the unhoused. Did you know that right now we're working toward having our School Connect Washington program this fall? Why are we doing that? Because if kids don't learn how to read by the third grade, the trajectory of their life is changed. We wanna be a church that looks at the problems of Seattle and says, oh, we can help with that. What if a hundred years from now, we were the most literate culture in Seattle? What if a hundred years from now, there were no more unhoused people? What if there was a tremendous creativity that came because of the steps that we took right now? We're committed to vulnerable migrants, to foster an adoption, to creation care, to historically marginalized communities. We're committed to kids and families. Right now, there's like two dozen families who are camping. There's 62 youth who are on retreat. There's a bunch of people out on an overnight weekend exploration of creation. Friends, let's join together and be the church in Seattle that makes a difference because God has promised that he's knocking. And that when we say yes, he'll come on in and he'll do far more abundantly than we could ask or imagine. Please pray with me.
Great God, we thank you. We thank you that you are the one who holds the seven stars in your hand. We thank you that you have a vision for who we can be, that we could be a part of your story. God, we thank you that when we stumble, when we fall, when we forget about you, you don't leave us alone. God, I thank you that you celebrate each one of us in a personal way, that you give us encouragement, that you give us kind of no-nonsense guidance, that you speak the truth in love. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for these promises that you have prepared a place for us, that we belong to you, that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen.